Praise you, God. Praise you, God. We use the prayer for today. Out of Scripture, Paul's writing to Timothy, and he says, Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That is for you. And you know what? While I'm at it, that is for me. I am going to receive that by faith right now, that word. Uh, literally, I just had a, uh, a breakthrough that I, I needed. Oh, man, it's so good. We're here filming again for Sunday service, but you know what? I'm believing that soon we will be getting together. We'll still film, but it'll be out there for those people that aren't able to make it to service. Uh, but we will have the choice for those of us that want to be here. Soon we will be able to gather in the sanctuary together. The breakthrough that I had... <laughs> Oh, man, let me give a little bit of a backdrop. It's been kind of an intense season personally. I know that some of you are experiencing that. I've been doing things with my family, my wife, uh, these, these challenges we've had. I, I may have shared we had somebody near and dear to us, um, our father-in-law, my wife's father. He, um, he had a fall a month and a half or so back and uh, fractured his hip. He's getting stronger by the day. We've used our faith. Oh, it was so glorious to see him come home from a rehab center, and uh, we were joyful. That was something that we prayed for, and um, more challenges set in. <laughs> you know, taking care of people, it's a blessing. It's a challenge as well, but you know what? If you are rooted and grounded in the Lord, you'll meet the challenge. If you don't allow yourself to get built up and spend some time with God, the challenges will really start affecting you. I'm telling you both of those scenarios because both of those scenarios have happened to me uh, and to my wife, but thanks be to God. Uh, God sends people to help and relieve uh, just when we, we, when we need it and we need to take that time for rest. So as I opened up in that prayer uh, that, that Paul wrote Timothy Grace, mercy, peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. When you look at the word grace, to really just simplify that, what that means is grace coming from, from Christ, grace coming from Christ our Lord. It's an ability to do stuff. When you look at mercy, mercy from Christ, that means Quite simply, not getting what you deserve. So I'll tell you what, I will take some mercy from the Lord today because there have been some things that I've thought, some things that I've done, just some actions that I've had that if I were to get what I deserve based on what I've done in the midst of operating in love, woo, boy, I might look a little different today. I, by faith, wore white. You know why? Because it's unblemished. It's, it's a representation of, of light and clarity and purity. I wore it by faith today. You know why? Because, to be quite honest, my natural man wanted to wear a little black, just a little gloom and doom, you know? So I put this on by faith. I clothed myself in faith. In 2 Timothy, it goes on to say in verse 5, or excuse me, verse 6, therefore, I remind you, Paul is writing Timothy, and I'm sharing this with you, and I'm sharing it with me. I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you, which is in you. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then that seed, that seed that can strengthen you is in there. All you have to do is stir it up. That breakthrough I talked about, one of the ways that it came just, just right, right before worship here was... Nehemiah 8.10, I began to confess that out loud. The joy of the Lord is my strength. And it, and it hit me. I've, I've read that before. I've heard that before. The joy of the Lord. So, so God has and is in possession of joy. What is that? It's just gladness. That means that God is glad. And his gladness, when you look to him, will strengthen you. It comes through what I just did comes through confession. That's how it manifests itself on you. 
You've heard me share many times before. If you haven't, you'll hear it for the first time now. It's an opportunity or choice to stir yourself up. And the way that these things manifest on you is when you get into a moment where you're pressed so hard and there seems like there's so much stuff coming at you that it's in those moments when you decide to humble yourself, which means not doing what you want to do, but humble yourself before your source. If you're a Christian, that's God. If you're not, God wants to be your source. I encourage you, make him, make him part of your life today by accepting his son, Jesus Christ, as your Lord and Savior. I'm grateful for it. I'm grateful for it. Like, even in this moment, I'm basking in an energy that I have not had for, for some days now. <laughs> and I just want to share that gladness with you. It's attainable. Today, the message that the Lord gave me to give to you it's just a simple title. It comes from scripture. Therefore, I endure. Therefore, I endure. Therefore, I endure. What I've realized, specifically in these last couple of days, to, to be transparent, I didn't really want to endure anything. Uh, I reached some mental limits and, you know, I knew enough not to say stuff within some of those moments, but man, I'm telling you, it was right there. Tip of the tongue. I didn't want to endure, but I knew better. And now today I'm grateful because what happens oftentimes when you go through these labor pains, if you will, it often means that you're about to birth something great. So that when you can endure things that you haven't before, that means that there's other things that, that, are, that are coming that are big. But as you exercise yourself and you endure, you will be ready for those things. Now, there's a, there's a frame uh, uh, or a, a school of thought that people might have going, listen, I, I don't want to endure. I just want to go easy peasy. <laughs> Just smooth, straight course. I don't want to do too much and have to endure more. Well, the issue with that is challenges aren't going to quit coming. They're just not. We wouldn't be reading things in Scripture that says to endure if there wasn't something to endure. So to try to ignore that and just or make yourself exempt from that is there's no value in it because there's stuff that just happens. I shared about, you know, my beloved father-in-law, my wife's father, going through some stuff. That happens. That's part of this physical life. And when you love somebody, you do things that maybe you wouldn't choose to do, but you do it. Why? Because it comes. And so... I want to read to you more from 2 Timothy and in the second chapter, verses 3 through 12. And I want to highlight a little bit more about this word, endure. Really what endure is, or enduring is, the definition is really profound. It means to last, Endure means to last, to continue in the same state without perishing. The Noah Webster defines it this way, to remain or to abide. That's what endure is. What, what is profound to me about that definition is to continue in the same state. So, hey, things are going good. You know, sometimes that happens uh, with us. I, I pray they happen more than, than, than the alternative. Uh, but that means when things are going good and you're in a, in a good, solid state, you know, things were going so good until this happened, until that happened. Well, this and that are going to happen. So endure means to continue in the same state of mind without perishing, being dwindled away. Now, I'll be the first to admit to the surprise of many of you, I'm not perfect. <laughs> and uh, you're going, yeah, I'm not surprised, Pastor, but I, I just got to share that. It's more for my benefit than yours. That, you know, I, 
I have got a pretty thick skin, and there's been some things that I've endured in life, and I'm okay, and, and it seems when I, you know, when something happens, I'm constantly thinking about what's the fix, what's the challenge, you know, and it's, it, it's, it, it's easy to do. I'm constantly, if I spill something, I'm not like, oh, man, you know, I'm thinking about, okay, what will, what will clean that up? Is it, is, it a, is it a paper towel? Is it a vacuum cleaner? What is it? Because let's just, let's just not look at the stuff that, that's spilled in your life. Let's figure out how to fix it. Oh, good for me, right? Well, these spills keep happening. They, see, they keep piling up, and you're like, okay, well, that's a little bigger. All right, pretty soon you start to get, you know, focus on the problem, and you start to shrink a little bit in stature, character stature. Hey, that's why the word says, to stir yourself up. Man, it's, it's good. It's good. So I'll, I'll get to the scripture. 2 Timothy, uh, it says it this way it, in verses 3 through 12 of the second chapter. Paul is writing to Timothy, and he says, You, therefore, must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Endure hardship. What is that hardship? Well, hardship is defined as uh, a toil, a, a fatigue, a severe labor. Sometimes this fatigue can be like physical fatigue, but oftentimes it's mental, like, wow, I don't know if I can take this anymore. You know, and, and the scripture, Paul is saying to young Timothy, who has got many challenges in front of him, dealing with many people and many personalities, you know, serving God through his church. And he's saying, you must endure hardship, some of this toil, some of this fatigue. You must endure, I mean, you need to continue in the same state that you were when hands were laid on you. He says, so stir that gift up. From that, draw energy and strength, not focusing on the things that are going on because it just wants to deplete you of strength. So endure this hardship. And again, I just got to make that point about try, those people or that mind, mindset or thought process that says, listen, I just want to eliminate hardship and just, you know, I just, I'd just rather do without it. I, I, I want to highlight that again because... Maybe it's more for me, but because it, 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 it comes. The hardships come. And, and, and when Timothy is hearing these words from Paul, I imagine as a good soldier, listen, I'm a minister. I'm not, I'm not a soldier, but, but Paul goes on to give a little bit of light to this. He says, no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life. Well, does that mean that you're not in this life? No, what he's trying to do is he's trying to say, Timothy, you're a soldier of Jesus Christ. Yes, there's things going on in this world, but you need to be focused on the one that enlisted you, not the problems that are going on in the world, right? It doesn't mean that you're, 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 you're not aware of the worldly problems. I won't go into detail about what the world is experiencing right now. Like literally global, you could say a couple words and everybody knows exactly what it is that I'm talking about. But in the midst of that, yes, it's going on, but who enlisted me in this life? Who brought me into this? The Bible says that God knew you before you were in your mother's womb. He's the one that made you. He's the one that created you. That when you were conceived from a spirit into the natural realm as a person, that now we have the opportunity to be, to be watered, nurtured by our mother and father, and praise God, hopefully... There's a point in your life that you became, to, you became in a position to have a mind of your own to ask Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And at that point, a second birth happens, meaning you have been physically birthed by your parents, but then a spiritual birth happens. And in that season, whenever it is that you made the decision to become born again spiritually, you have been trained in, in, in mind and, and through experience of life of all these hardships that are coming. So you got a hardwired process. Of, of knowing and being aware of all the stuff that's happening in this world and then you get born again and you hear about this savior that can allow you to manage through him these things that are going on. So this is what Paul is saying. Hey, stir yourself up. Remember who created you. Yeah, there's stuff going on. But endure 
You must endure hardship like a good soldier of Jesus Christ. I like it. It stirs me up. I've had knowledge of this, but I'm telling you, when you really get into it, it starts to be your truth, and it says, I can do more. I can do more. I can do more. I, I, I love it. He says, the Amplified says of 2 Timothy verse 4, the Amplified translation says, no soldier when in service gets entangled in the enterprises of civilian life. His aim is to satisfy and please the one who enlisted him. See, here's the problem that people run into. That scripture is saying, hey, my aim is to please the Lord. But what happens is these hardships come on, and you're like, look, it, I just want comfort. I want relief. I just need to check out. I, I just, you know, I get it. I love you, Lord. I love you. But, man, don't you see what I'm going through? I'll answer the question. He does. But I'm talking about this mindset and that. You start feeling a little sorry for yourself, a little victimized. You're a little fatigued. You're a little tired. You're a little wore out. Your fuse, short. <laughs> your, your, your pool of grace and mercy that you want to put on other people, it's low. I mean, the tank is on, it's, it's on vapors, meaning if you press the gas a little more, you're going to stall, and man, that's the time when people blow up. So I'm sharing this because I'm fresh on the coattails of being there mentally a few times recently. Praise be to God. Quit's not in me. Quit is not in me. Why? Because I've studied, spent time enough with the Lord to know some of these words, the words that he speaks, the words that give life, the words that lead to truth, the Holy Spirit inside that guides and counsels. I'm sharing this with you because God is no respecter of persons. That means if he'll do it for me, he'll do it for you. He'll do it for you, but it comes through humility. It comes through first knowing, you know what, I, I gotta endure this stuff because it's gonna come. Let me give you a natural analogy of what I mean by things coming that you can't control. Um, you know, I, I, I watch YouTube a lot. I, I, I really enjoy gathering information. Could be about hobbies. Could be, you know, oftentimes it's, it's uh, searching out the word and different ministers and ministries and different worship. I'm really blessed with that. And one way particularly, there are times when I recognize that I'm dry. I'll go to YouTube as a source to listen to, to worship music. I mean, it just eases my soul. It just puts me in a place that I know that nothing else can wash away what's going on. I just got to get into that into that place. And so I've noticed specifically these last few days, I don't know if it's some new algorithm or program or thing that YouTube is doing, but this is what's happened. I'm like, oh, I'm so dry, man. I'm just parched. I need a little bit of, I need a little bit of worship, and I'm just right there. I'm like, I'm on the brink. You know, nothing else can come in. Please don't let anything else come in, but nothing else better come in. This is my mindset. So I go and I find these, worships, these worship songs that I like, and I push the button. And this is what's been happening lately. Advertisements. Some people might call them advertisements. I don't care. Tomato, tomato. It doesn't matter. The point is, is it's something that interrupts. But now YouTube's given you a choice. You will experience four ads within the context of what it is that you really want to get to. Would you rather watch those now or during? I don't want to watch them at all. I mean, where's that button? You know, I know there's little, little prompts that say, hey, if you want to get the exclusive, you know, program YouTube, it only costs you so much. You, you could try that. You pay more for no ads. I'm like, so <sighs> fold my arms. I'm like, you know what? Let's just get this out of the way. Just, let's just run them on the front side, these ads. And then what happens is they go, and, you know, it used to seem like back in the, you know, I, don't know, I was going to say back in the day, I suppose, but it just seemed like it wasn't too long ago that when an ad came on, it gave you this little prompt and you could skip the ad, like right now. No, no more. It's like, you gotta listen, 15 seconds of it. The little yellow bar comes, you can't fast forward it, you can't pause it. It's like 15 seconds of this advertisement. Then skip, okay, there's one out of the way. I got three more before I need to be refreshed. And the third one, and by the time you get into the fourth one, man, I wanna spike that computer like a football. I want to drop back five and punt. That's what my carnal man wants to do. My carnal man is, is that human nature void of, of divine influence. But the reason I'm describing this moment to you in such detail is because this is what happens. It does. People fall and hurt themselves, and you got to, you know, praise God, you get to serve them. And then, you know, string together 
five nights in a row where you don't get more than four hours of sleep in a row. Praise the Lord. That's what happens. <laughs> That's what happens. And Paul, he just says, as a believer, endure. He needs to continue in, in a good state of mind. Endure as a good soldier. A soldier, you say, well, I may not be in a service military-wise, but if you've given your life to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the commander-in-chief, he said in Scripture, why do you call me Lord and don't do what I say? What he's saying is, hey, you've got to endure during these hardships. Don't give in. What that means is you'll have to get a little bit of rest. Some, some point, some way, you might have to go to sleep earlier to get up earlier so that you could have a moment with the Lord, a little bit of peace uh, uh, and, and, and soundness of mind so that you can handle what's going on through the day. Some of you may be going, well, I was getting up earlier, but now something happened and, and it got into my time in the morning. Well, you can only do that for so long and schedules change as part of these Troubles and hardships that come. Something new gets introduced into your life that might now jump right into your pool of peacefulness in the morning hours that you normally had. Guess what? You might have to get up a little earlier, deal with a little less sleep. How badly do you want to be refreshed? You might have to endure four ads before you watch what you want to watch. So I do, I just sit there, and as soon as that yellow bar goes across on the screen, skip that ad, three more, there's a second one, skip that ad, halfway there, just keep on, keeping on. More stuff's gonna come, but you know what? There's more fuel to handle the more stuff. That fuel, if you choose to, can be the power of God, the joy, the gladness. God is glad. He is joy. He is power. When you tap into it, your tank will be filled up, but it's so important to do that. These last few weeks, I've referenced by the Holy Spirit some scriptures in the book of Mark about Jesus when he fed the 5,000 men and their families. When that was over, he sent the multitudes away. He told the disciples to get into the boat, row to the other side, they're rowing towards home. But then Jesus went to the mountain to pray. And in the evening, sometime between 3 and 6 p.m., a storm had come up. Jesus could see the disciples straining against the storm. And then it says, that sometime between 3 and 6 a.m., he finally went to them, and they hadn't gained much, well, I was going to say ground, but I guess there's ground somewhere below the surface of the water, but they were straining. He went to them because they were straining. The reason I'm sharing this with you is that little, to, to keep that scripture in context, I kind of want to back up a little bit before that. Why were they even in a deserted place? Why were they even out there and then the multitudes came and they fed them and then everything that I just described happened. I, I want to back up a little bit in Mark chapter 6, verse 31. The, in, in the context of this, this particular verse, the disciples had just done some things that they didn't really want to do. John the Baptist had been beheaded. Jesus loved John. John had a massive calling on his life. He was the one that said, repent, meaning change the way you think because a great one is coming. And then the great one, Jesus, came. John baptized him in the Jordan. The heavens opened up. The Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove on our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Right, This is a miraculous thing. And then John was in prison. And if you study scriptures, you'll know what happened to John. He, he was beheaded. And the disciples, they took his body and, and they, they, they went through all this stuff. And then they came to Jesus. They are wore out. They told Jesus all this stuff that happened. John was beheaded. We had to get the body. We had to deal with that. I, I'm sure that wasn't 
that wasn't real pleasing to the spirit or to the eye. And in verse 31, Jesus said this. He said to them, come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat. Jesus recognized his disciples were really depleted. So they went out to this deserted place, but guess what? All these people followed them. Can you imagine the disciples on that day? Wow. Jesus being the son of God and having the anointing, still feeling what they felt, the disciples, probably tired, physically tired, but compassion ruled his heart, and he ministered to the 5,000. And in the midst of that, even when the disciples were tired, they'd seen all that they had seen. They were tired. They hadn't even had time to eat. And Jesus is ministering, and they're probably going, yeah, this is a good word, but it was a long day. A lot of stuff happened. They're probably just, some of them at their breaking point. And finally, we know when these people were hungry, the disciples started to go, hey, Lord, send these people away. We're done. <laughs> Where are we going to get food out here for all these people? And then Jesus asked Philip a question. Hey, where are we going to get money to buy food for these people? He knew, Jesus knew the answer. He knew what he was about to do. But he said this to test them. Being tested in a moment when they were done. We came out here in the first place just to get some rest. And now... The word, Jesus, wants to teach us the good word. I'm glad you got compassion, Jesus, but we're done. This is what happens. This is the stuff that I'm talking about. This is the ad that you got to listen to, that you have no interest in before you get to what it is that you want to get to. Can you endure in that moment? In your own power, it might be challenging. The reason I'm sharing this with you is the takeaway is that you do need rest. And sometimes it's not exactly in the moment that you want it. Once people were fed, Jesus sent them away. The disciples, now they went to have, yes, they had a full belly, but they had to go do some physical work. They had to row to get home and a storm came against them. What did Jesus do? He also went to pray and get communion and fellowship with the Father. And even though Jesus saw them sh straining in the evening time, he didn't come to them to the morning. I thought about this. I was like, well, Lord, if you saw them straining and you're the son of God, what, why didn't you just go to them right away? It wasn't to teach them a lesson. Remember that the Lord, when he was here, his body knew hunger his body also knew fatigue. His body felt all the things that we felt, but he knew what he needed to do. He needed to go spend time with the Father to get re-energized. And what did he do after he got re-energized? He walked on water. He walked on water. Come to a deserted place by yourself. Get a little rest. It's important to have that understanding. It's ministering to me right now because what happens is when you're in that place of spiritual dryness, in essence, a spiritual problem, you only have a couple directions you can go. You can focus on the problem and you having that spiritual problem will get to a place that you are so depleted that you're gonna do something that you probably have to repent of later. Or within that moment, that you can get some time with the Lord. What does that mean? Pray, yes, by prayer and supplication, make your requests and be made known to God. Go, go to the word, get in his presence. Lord, I'm having an issue, just take him away sometimes is your prayer. Well, take yourself away and rest in the Lord. Sometimes it's just be still. Get up a little earlier or take a moment if you're in the midst of chaos, if you can just grasp a few seconds by yourself and just get quiet. I love you, Lord. I know that you can strengthen me and encourage me in this moment. And 
to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might, as it says in Ephesians 6.10, oftentimes comes through what I just shared, my breakthrough, that you're saying to scripture like Nehemiah 8.10, the joy of the Lord is my strength, right? You're not feeling very joyous, but that's why his joy can be your strength because in that moment, you can just say, the joy of the Lord is my strength. His gladness, he is gladness, he loves me, that will be my strength. And as you continue to confess that, literally, it's spiritual watering of the seed that's inside you. That's what it means when Paul said to stir that up, right? That seed is in there, but when you stir it up by speaking the word of God in those moments, the manifestation of God's joy will come all over you and you'll have an ability to endure through God's strength. It's good news. It is really good news. These spiritual problems that we have, God didn't introduce them or induce them to us. They are almost 100% of the time self-induced. And, you know, the devil can't be blamed for a lot of these either. Sometimes we, you know, we want to go, oh, he's the one that did this. He does a lot of stuff, but oftentimes these spiritual problems, when we get so depleted because these storms that are inevitable that come, we, get, we allow ourselves to get drained to such a point that we just want to blame it on the devil. And the reality is, it's not his fault either most of the time. They're self-induced. We, we haven't taken the time. We burn ourselves out. We've done too much stuff. The devil just takes advantage of those moments. In essence, that dirty ground, that depleted place that we allow ourselves to get to, he has more access to that, and he's just waiting for the words, just like God is, that when you get to that point, you'll either say, the joy of the Lord is my strength, and the devil can't do nothing, or you'll go, I'm done. Don't say anything else to me. Don't. Just get away from me. And the devil's like, yeah, access. See, you're the one in the middle ground. You're the one that can stir yourself up. And this is why the scripture is saying, endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. First, it comes through identity. Who are you? Yes, you have a name and you are a person and you may hold a job and be a specific, specific part of a of family. You may be a mother, a, a, you know, a, a brother, a, a father, a, a son, a daughter. You may be some, some, well, in fact, you are somebody within a family. But my point is, is regardless of who you are, if spiritually you have given yourself to God by accepting his son, then you are a soldier of Christ. Now, just like there's ranks in the military, there are ranks that we hold as the family or the body of Christ. Some of us just want to do just enough to get by. But you should be trying to ascend or be promoted in rankings. And again, as I said, these challenges that come, these battles, if you will, They're just coming, and you can use it as an opportunity to grow and get the good things that God has for you. Paul goes on to say in 2 Timothy, he said, consider what I say, and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. What do you need understanding in? A lot of what I just described have understanding that this world's not a perfect place, but it to endure. Verse 8, 2 Timothy says, Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Why does he share that? Because Christ went to the cross and endured all things for us that we might have victory by him and through him, by submission to him. He was raised from the dead according to my gospel for which I suffered trouble. Paul was writing this in jail. 
He suffered trouble as an evildoer, meaning he didn't do evil, but people thought, hey, you're an evildoer. You're trying to do all this good. It's contrary to what we want, this worldly message. Go to prison. So Paul's literally writing from this. He said, I suffer, tr- I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even to the point of chains. But he pulls up this reminder. He said, but the word of God is not chained. That means what I was sharing about confessing the joy of the Lord is my strength, that I may, be felt, I may have felt like I was... And you may feel this way too, that you just can't take no more. You're shackled up by problems and circumstances and things that just seem like they're not there. But when you start to speak the word of God, it is over those things that are coming against you, meaning it is not chained. It does not have restrictions that if you say it and you water that seed in you, the manifestation of what it is will come to pass. It just does. If you believe it, it works. If you don't, it won't. This is why I want to go back to that point. What is, who, do, who are you? Who are you? Have you called Jesus Christ your Lord? Then you should be, you should not, in, you should not worry about the problems in the world, but the one that enlisted you. He's the one that can give you the, the commands, the orders, the things that will bring you through the battle. There's so much more that I want to share, but for the sake of time. The book of Colossians says, as you have therefore received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Established just means to make firm, confirm, or make sure. It means to be durable, dependable, or reliable. So when it's saying be established in faith, 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 it's not a denomination. Faith is a substance of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. If your faith is small, you've probably been listening to the world. If your faith is big, it's because you've been listening to the word. That simple. All you have to do is identify where you're at and you have an opportunity or decision, regardless of how severe the storm feels, as a believer in Christ Jesus, this opportunity, and I pray the decision you make, is him, is the Lord, is his word. And when conviction comes and you believe that, the desire and the fuel to have the proper corresponding action will follow. I don't know where you're at or what's going on in your life, but I am confident there's some good stuff, and I'm also confident that there are some challenges. Trust the Lord. Trust the Lord. Stir yourself up in the love of God. I pray this message just blessed you and encouraged you. Really, to summarize, it's time to soldier up a little bit. I pray God send the labors of love in your life to relieve you when you're rowing against a storm. I pray God send the labors of peace and joy, people that would have your ear If you're in a challenge, I pray that God sends them to you. Why? Because when you're encouraged and you're filled up, then you also can be a labor of love sent by the Holy Spirit to somebody else that need it, that needs it in a great way. This is how it works. This is how it works. You get filled up to the point of overflow and it touches somebody else. If you're on empty... God can fill you. I love you. I hope and pray that this minister to you, to God be the glory. Amen. 
Praise be to God. Uh, I also want to give the opportunity. I certainly want to take it while I'm here. God's been great and faithful through this time for me personally, my wife, and providing for our family uh, financially, certainly spiritually. But I just want to give an opportunity that as you're led by the Spirit of God to give tithes to your church home or offerings, wherever the Lord is putting on your heart to offer. We know his word says he loves a cheerful giver. So if you're feeling that prodding to sow into the kingdom so the kingdom can keep growing, well, that's a blessing. So wherever you're at, just lay your hand on your seed. If you, if you haven't physically got it in front of you right now, well, the seed is still inside you, so just lay your hand on your spirit and right here where it resides, your spirit, man. Father, we thank you, Lord. You're such a good God. And from every seed, every seed that is sown into your kingdom, that there is a fruit, a manifestation of harvest on that seed to your glory. Father, we thank you that as we sow it into your kingdom, that there, there is food in your house to feed those that are in need. We praise you. We give you glory. In Jesus' name, amen.